you get to the village of Krasnohorivka. 800 meters to the Russian positions, he said there. So quick, quick, quick. There's some heavy shelling with grad, multiple rocket launchers from time to time. It's going to be hard to get past. Here's a part of the first grad rocket that hit us. So those were two airdropped bombs, uh, unmistakable sounds. Everything can become a habit. People can get used to anything. Everything is destroyed. We get to the village of Krasnohorivka. It's actually a small city. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that not only is it right on the front line, like the nearest Russian positions are just a kilometer or two outside the city limits, but it's also been on the front line all the way since 2014, uh, when Russia's war against Ukraine actually started here. You just go a little bit further and you reach the city of Marinka on one side, which doesn't exist anymore, and further north of Divka and to the east, you have Donetsk itself. The fighting so far during the full-scale invasion, despite it being right on the front line, has been really not too intense. But that's changing. So we just need to be really quick and, and careful here uh, in this open territory, because just down there, basically behind those tree lines, is where the front line uh, begins in the direction of Marinka. Um, you can see we've got open... Huh? Okay. Yeah, so he, he can just hear everything. We had some outgoing, and when you hear outgoing coming from far away, from the direction of the front line, that could be coming towards you. That's why we just got down for a second. Oh, Wait, the store is still, still, still open. <laughs> and in the middle of all that, we have a shop that's working with three dogs. Um, so let's... Uh, Should we buy something? Hello? Hello, boys. You shocked us now. Why? Because the store's open. How are you? Everything's fine with us. How are you here? I'm just shocked. Thank God, we're okay. We are with the Lord. He protects us. We feed people. Thank God. Look, this was hit recently. And when was this? Maybe a week ago, or two. I don't pay attention to that. <laughs> I'm washing the floor now. When it's quiet, I sweep the streets. I mean, you know, life goes on. You are risking your life by coming here too, so... You saw the road, right? We call it the road of life. Why did you call it the road of life? What do you mean, why? Haven't you seen how heavily it's shelled and all the cars there? That's why it's called the road of life. Oh, mandarin. Uh, uh, mandarin. <laughs> we need to be quick here because, again, we've got that line of sight starting to clear up now. But there's something interesting that he wants to show. You can see here, you've got the old petrol prices from um, back in the day, 2014, when uh, the war just started. When you had these so-called Russian separatists, proxy forces basically, uh, stirring up trouble, setting up checkpoints, occupying towns and buildings. This was one of the centers of operation, right between Marinka and Donetsk over here. Ukraine later liberated that area, but since then, already, this was just a kind of dead zone. Uh, and the front line was just there, not too far away from here. So since then, it's like a time capsule, basically, of 
of and a, and a reminder at the end of the day that Russia's war didn't start in February 24th, 2022, but almost 10 years ago now. What did she say? Their positions are about 800 meters away. 800 meters to the Russian positions, he said there. So quick, quick, quick. As you can see, there are still a couple of people walking around, a couple of people holding their shops in this area, but this is really pretty much almost the zero line. So almost all of these flats are abandoned. It's uh, quite strange to see windows that are still not blown out yet. You can see the marks all around here of where artillery and shrapnel have just crashed through buildings. It's strange with these people talking to them, like their logic, because at the moment there's no hope for, for things immediately getting better. We have Ukraine not really pushing forward uh, since the counteroffensive. It's just comparable to my memories from Bakhmut or Avdiivka where it just gets worse and worse, you know, more and more destruction, no rebuilding, no relief from the shelling. But still, people hang on. Um, it's, not, it's not something that can often be explained rationally. I mean, almost never, but, but we, we can't judge them, I guess. These are their homes, you know. Here you are. Who wants a blanket? Nice blanket. Not great. Yes, there's some heavy shelling with grads from time to time. For the last few months, right? Yes, a few days ago, my brother was in my apartment. A grad rocket flew right into the building entrance and made a hole on the fifth floor. Mm -hmm. I took bread, candles that burn for a long time, and a blanket. What is the situation with the water? Putin announced his special operation on uh, February 24th. It was a Thursday. And since Sunday that week, we have no longer had water. How do we live here? Fine. My house was destroyed. I lived on the border of the city. My wife died because she had three heart attacks. We didn't evacuate anywhere. Even though this town was on the front line for almost 10 years now, what you're seeing around here, the destruction, almost all of it has happened since the full-scale war started because by then it's going to be hard to get past. Um, by then it was already the regular Russian army fighting at full strength using all of its heavy artillery. The driver's saying that what, what we can see here, have a look at the trees uh, blocking the road here for us. It's all new. So he, can't, he comes in here pretty regularly, but basically every time you visit this place, another building, another thing has been destroyed. Just over here to the right, he was saying there used to be a palace of culture these big buildings in each town that the Soviets built for cultural events and, and there's just nothing left. <laughs> you can see the, the smoke coming out from a few of these buildings. It's, uh, it's not, uh, not shelling or anything, that's just the wood-fired stove that they usually heat with. Uh, in winter. So again, no electricity, no water, no nothing. It's really back to basics and um, they, they hang on to this city and these homes of theirs so much uh, that they really equip these basements with, with everything that you need for, I don't want to say a comfortable life, but some kind of life. Here's the oven. I would bake when there was electricity, but I don't anymore. We still have a washing machine. Here's our laundry. We do laundry from time to time.
Why do I live in the basement? Two grad shells destroyed our apartment. There's nothing there, not even walls. There was shelling, we just accidentally happened to go down to the basement. And well, we haven't returned home. Then the second shelling happened. Oh, if we were at home, we would have been dead. Now we sleep here. I cook here. Today is a cleaning day for me. Here's the stove when there is electricity. Everything's electric, right? Yes. When there is no electricity, we wait. Sometimes we use a potbelly stove if the wind doesn't blow in here. We can't cook on it. We don't have enough firewood for that. We warm ourselves up with it a little bit. And we wait. We can also warm up some water to make instant noodles or drink hot water. Uh -huh. I have different types of tea in here. Here are my pans and scales for weighing flour. <coughs> because of the dust. If I need a frying pan, it's already clean because it was in a plastic bag. There's a lot of dust in here. A basement is a basement. Nothing. I sit in the basement. It's very quiet today. Well, we have a computer. When there is electricity, I turn on the computer. But there's constantly bang, bang, bang. I'm busy with the photographs, of course. This is one of the recent ones. This is my daughter and grandchildren. My granddaughter is two years old. When we communicate with my daughter, Larissa actually communicates with her because I don't go upstairs. She communicates with her through a neighbor via the internet and receives photos from our daughter. Look at these beauties. I do it for myself. Well, when there was the internet, I posted it on my page. And now... Well, it's scary, of course. Our building has been hit so many times. Our section alone was hit three times. The second floor, above us, then our apartment and our neighbors. It was very hard at first, very hard. I still sometimes get nervous and cry. But anything can become a habit. People can get used to anything. If they had offered me to leave 20 years ago, I would have left. And now, no, the home is home. <laughs> Be careful, there's a piece from the TV. This was the kitchen. All the furniture is destroyed. So is the refrigerator. That's all that's left of the furniture, a sofa and two chairs. There was a wall here, it's gone now. This is where it hit. It came in through the ceiling. Here's a part of the first grad rocket that hit us. I threw it out. I took the second shell fragment out of the basement and also put it into the trash. Everything is destroyed. So those were two air-dropped bombs, uh, unmistakable sounds bigger than any artillery shell or rocket. Um, so Russian aircraft are working in this area. They've seen some targets and they've dropped these. They're usually these gliding bombs that fly a bit further and they have some precision function. Uh, now we're just going to wait and see what other sounds we can hear. 
um, because that's how you basically figure out who's firing where and uh, when's the right time to, to get out of here. But we definitely do have to get out of here. So now it's just quarter past one in, in the afternoon and you can see how dramatically the, the weather has changed. So the sun's out, the clouds have spread out, you've got long lines of sight for kilometres and that means that enemy drones, enemy planes, enemy artillery can basically work however they want. Where we're going now, well we're leaving now the city but everything that moves in the city now can be seen and it's just a matter of time. Again, we've got Donetsk just off to the right, that way, Marinka further down. And if you go towards the north, you'll see Avdivka. This place has been on the edge for so long, but you can feel that just in the last few months, it, it started to get, to get critical. And then this is the kind of calm before the storm, I could guess, for this city.